So we're going to mentally shift gears now for the next, not counting spring break week, the next five weeks for the class. Um, what we're going to do now is take off your worker hat, take off your consumer hat, put on your business owner hat. That's what we're going to be doing. These are going to be things you talk about for those of you running your own business, wanting to run your own business. This is stuff that's going on. Ultimately, this is the close to accounting is where we're going to get. <laughs> but, uh, but it ain't no, it's nowhere near accounting, but this is 2% accounting. But we're going to uh, talk about the costs. If you really got to think about and get a hold of the costs that you have for your business, and then you maybe might start putting together more than you might think at first. Anyway. Uh, but then the next four chapters are going to be the next three modules, four modules, I can't remember how I split them out. But we're going beyond that too. Well, let's look at the market that you're in because different markets and different industries have different rules. And so you end up with different behaviors based on things like how many people you're competing against, based on how, how big a player you are in the game, based on how easy is it for other people to start competing against you. So that's where we're going to be going to starting in module seven. But module six is supply costs. This is your cost of doing business. And it starts with you have these two parts. Notice even 143 should you have a flashback, Gary. Because uh, I think I cut this to this exact same slide. Um, you have two kinds of costs fixed costs that don't change as your production changes. And in variable costs, it will change as your production changes. The way to think about the variable costs is ingredients. And then the fixed costs are your tools. You don't buy an oven, bake a cake, and then throw the oven away, right? For every new cake we're going to bake, we're going to buy a new oven? No. You, that oven is fixed, it stays in place, and you use it for cake after cake after cake. For the ingredients, you don't take the eggs out of one cake and use them to make a second cake, do you? No, trust me, you don't. Uh, but the ingredients, that, that's your variable cost. So the more cakes you bake, the more eggs you can use, the more sugar you can use, the more vanilla extract you can use. So those are going to be varying. Your egg, your egg expense is going to vary based on how much, how many cakes you bake. But within your narrow window of where you are now, your oven cost isn't going to change. You have an oven, and you have an oven. In the long term, yeah. If you make enough cakes, you might buy a second oven. But in short term, where you are now, just think about where we are this week, where you are this month. Your oven cost is going to change. Your building is going to change. Your rent is going to change. So you fix costs, buildings, machinery, the rent you may have to pay, trucks, cars, ovens, refrigerators, mixers, tractors. Those should be your fixed costs. Your variable costs are going to be labor, fuel, electricity, maintenance expenses. Those are going to be things that the more you do, the more you're going to use. So, here's an example that I just sort of started going with already. Uh, running a bakery. Baking cakes, your fixed cost would be oven's refrigerator, rent on a building. You know, the, you, the landlord, they don't care how many cakes you bake. You are in the building for 30 days, you are with rent, right? Uh, your truck payment, it don't matter how many money, any of you ever bought a vehicle and make car payments, your payment don't change based on how much you drive, does it? Nope. Like you, you just because you have the car, you got to pay you $300 a month. Insurance, those are going to be fixed costs where your variable costs, eggs, sugar, flour, gas. Yeah, you're not using gas in the cakes, but you're using gas in the truck you're delivering the cakes with, right? Electricity. Um, for a car, having a car, your fixed cost for owning a vehicle, this is going to be what stuff you have to pay whether you drive that car or not. Or what do you have to pay in order to have the right to drive that car in the first place? You got to make a payment. If you ain't making payments, they're coming to take your car away, right? You got to, your payment, you got to have the insurance on it or the government won't let you drive it. You got an insurance, you got to have a license plate, you got to have an inspection sticker, in some areas you got to have a county sticker. All right. Now, finally, Henry County, where I live, we finally, last year, we got rid of our county sticker. Anyway, but 
You have to have these, and it doesn't matter. Whether you drive one mile, a thousand miles, ten thousand miles, twenty thousand miles, the county sticker still costs the same. The inspection still costs the same. Might be the payment still is the same. Inspection. Huh? Well, not because you're driving, but it might have, did, did it go up as far as from year to year? Okay. I've got a few more months before I do it again. Um, has anybody bought a vehicle lately? Okay, same. Um, what's your car paint? Are you talking about your truck? Was that your truck that you were in the other day? Or did somebody else? You put yourself down. Oh, so what, what's, your, what's your car payment? 1500 by the riding kids. So you're paying $1,500 a month for this car. No, that's how much the car costs, right? No. $500. Yeah, so it costs him $500 a month he's paying to the dealership or the court. What kind of cars? So Honda Incorporated. He's paying $500. Even if he doesn't drive it, even if he is sick, even if he breaks his he breaks his neck and the doctor say you can't drive for six weeks, he can't not make a car payment, right? Okay, insurance. Hundred bucks a month, hundred and fifty. He's a young male, so yeah. Boom. Uh tags, let's see, they're like twenty bucks a year. Let's call that two dollars a month. Just average it out. An inspection sticker, 20 bucks a year. Let's just call that $2 a month. County sticker, same thing. So before he can drive, before he drives a vehicle anywhere, just so he has the right and ability to drive, it's costing him $606. It's costing him $606 to have this car and he ain't even put it in gear the first time yet. Now, what kind of gas mileage do you get on this car? 35 gallon. 35 gallon. Oh, yeah, the Honda. So let's just 35 gallon, 35, 17, let's just call it six cents. Costing him six cents worth of gas for every mile that he drives. Six times thirty-five should be giving you closer to two dollars compared to the price of gas. Every he drove this, he owned this. Well, what the oil? Do you get your oil changed every three thousand miles like a good person? Yes. You pay thirty dollars in a place to do it. Yes. So thirty three thousand divided by thirty dollars is. You use the penny worth of oil for each mile that you drive. Tires. You're paying three hundred dollars for a set of four to last you thirty thousand miles, so you're wearing out one cent's worth of tires for every mile that you drive. Which your wiper fluid? Half a cent, but the more you drive, the more windshield wiper fluid you use because you got more dead bugs to wipe off the windshield, right? Uh, spark plugs. Well, you don't think about them, but you know the more you drive, the more you're wearing them out, the faster you got to replace them, All right? So I'm not gonna add. This. Why not? So all total, six, seven, eight. It costs him nine cents per mile to drive that car. So if Sam has his car and then he broke his neck at like 8 a.m. the first day of the month and he's only driven that car one mile, how much did it cost him to drive that car one mile? Six hundred six dollars and nine cents. Oh, is it worth it? I think you could get an Uber and take care of business for a whole lot cheaper than that. Yeah. So if Sam would, I'll give that ain't reasonable yet. So, but this is what happens. This is what you got to pay no matter how much you drive. Whether you drive that car one mile, a thousand miles, ten thousand miles, this six hundred six doesn't change a bit. Whereas if he drives one mile, nine cents worth of gas and oil. If he drives a thousand miles, that's nine, $90 dollars worth of oil and gas. If he drives ten thousand miles, that's nine hundred dollars worth of oil and gas. 
right? So those are going to change. That's how it works. Let me go back for just for a minute, just for the fun of this. So, I mean, y'all got this? I mean, it should be rocket science here, I hope. But, so, I'm getting a little bit, I, I'll probably have it on the slide somewhere, but I don't know. There are some things that are both fixed and variable. Some expenses are fixed and variable at the same time, like labor. You might have some people on salary, some people on hourly. Electricity or stuff, do they like, you know, do, there's a certain amount you have to pay. Oh, y'all don't have the experience with this much now, but like bandwidth for you, like for your phone, you have some data or whatever. You know, you pay, you know, you're 50 bucks a month, they give you five gigs. So that first five gigs is a fixed cost. If you go beyond your five gigs, what ends up happening? So, your bill starts going up again. So you have the fixed portion, your unlimited talk, unlimited text, and the first five gigs of data is fixed. But then once you go beyond five gigs of data, then you suddenly get a variable part of this. Some of the stuff kind of end up. Electricity. Well, you gotta have some electricity because you gotta have the air conditioner running. No matter what, you gotta have the heater running at least a little bit to keep the temperature of the building at least above 50, something to keep the pipes freezing, right? So you're still using some electricity even if the place is empty. You don't believe me, go and find a home that is, the people have moved out and nobody else has moved in yet. They're still paying water, they're still paying some electricity, they're still paying for the gas. So we're, there's still some expenses there. There is some mixed and variable, some things that cross over in both categories. Generally speaking, let's try to keep it simple, but you know, stuff that changes, stuff that doesn't change. So, we have two ways to measure our fixed costs. You can do, I have slides for each of these. Total fixed cost, what is the total amount that Sam is spending on his fixed costs for his driving his car? Or we can do average fixed cost, where you start saying spreading that fixed cost out over how many miles you drive the car. I'll come to the logic for that here in the next few minutes. The total fixed cost is flat line. It is what it is. It doesn't matter quantity in this case is the number of miles he drives. Right? And it doesn't matter if he drives one mile, thousand miles, ten thousand miles. This number was what? $606, right? Right, that was a number, yeah. So it's a constant number, you just get that by adding up all of your fixed costs. If only counting was this easy, right? Your average fixed cost is you take your total fixed cost and you divide it by, in this case, how many miles did you drive? How many miles did you drive? How many cakes did you bake? How many t-shirts did you make? How many trees did you cut down? How many acres did you plow? To spread out the cost to decide how much did it cost you? If I'm buying this tractor, how much per acre is it going to cost me to be using this tractor? Am I going to make enough money off of, you know, off of whatever, the beans or whatever? to pay for the tracker. So, Sam, your total fixed cost is $606. On an average normal month, how many miles do you say you drive? Just coming back to work to work, that's very true. So, so he's $606 divided by 3,000. Somebody got a calculator? Uh, that's one bit, that's like 20 cents. So, what is 
this is me. It, say he's using this car, not for the fun of it, say he's using it to, as a taxi, as a delivery service, as an Uber driver, or something like that. So if he's doing 3,000 miles worth of deliveries, delivering people or parts, whatever it is he's doing, if he's gonna drive that thing 3,000 miles, spread out this $606 by 3,000 miles, that's 20 cents. So what he needs to do is he's gonna say, if I'm charging people for their Uber ride or for whatever deliveries, I need to get 20 cents out of them for each mile I drive in order to let me get the money I need to pay all my fixed costs. You'll see that. So if he is doing his Ubering, he's deliveries, okay. If he's doing his deliveries and the people are only going to pay him 10 cents a mile or something like that, he's not going to be able to pay off his car. You're just, he's, that six hundred six dollars just disappeared. So apparently, congratulations. Well, you drew a circle around it a minute ago, and then you just tapped it. So that's it. Uh, all right. Then. Uh, that just blew my mind. Okay. So, um, I mean, not really blew my mind. So, this is kind of your starting point for. If you're going to buy the car to go in business, you need to ask yourself, can I make 20 cents a mile? I, I think I can do 300 or 3,000 miles with the deliveries. If I do 3,000 miles of delivery, can I get 20 cents per mile or more to do it? If not, forget about it. It ain't worth it. Because he'll never, he won't be paying for the car. If you only get 10 cents a mile, well, guess what? He need to be doing 6,000 miles in order to get the 10 cents a mile to get the money that he needs. Right? But of course, it's more complicated than that. And the math is just that simple. You just take the fixed cost that you add it up, you come up with six actually, and you divide it by how many miles you drove. Okay, I forgot to add that. Total fixed cost for you OCD people at home is 6,000, and he's driving for 3,000 miles, so that gave us what was it, six cents? Uh, it's kind of what the questions will look like on the test. And on the homework that we will have for this chapter to help you prepare for the next three steps. The homework, somebody remind me at the end of class and I will go to my office and make sure that the homework will be available at the end of this after class. Another example, for those of you who can't read my handwriting, is this company has $100,000 worth of printing presses and delivery trucks and they usually need to print 40,000 books. So that means it's costing them $2.50 worth of equipment for each book that they make. So they need to make $2.50 off of each book, take that money in order to pay off their equipment, to pay for their equipment. Oh, yes, yeah. they're going to need more than that because they need to cover their variable costs as well. Because the other thing that Sam needs to say is, well, I don't just need to make six cents a mile so I can pay my car payment, but I also need to get, or what was it, 20 cents a mile? 20. I'm sorry, I'm going to slide to go over the wrong number again. Okay. Uh, he not only needs 20 cents a mile to make his car payment, well, as we kind of already saw, he needs to make another 9 cents a mile to pay the oil and gas for fire for these years, right? And so that's our variable costs, and we can look at the total variable costs where you add it, well, you look at how much Sam said, I'll come back, total variable cost, average variable cost, which is spreading it out per mile, marginal cost, which marginal means what? Extra. It don't matter what you've done so far, what's it gonna cost you to drive the next mile? Your total variable cost, this is going to be, and this is what you should do as business. If Sam should sit there, and at the end of the month, he needs to be digging through his wallet, pulling out all the receipts from the gas station, pull out a receipt from the oil shaking place, pull out a receipt from the tire place, pull it all out and say, how much did I spend on this car this month? 
for the gas, the oil, the tires, all the variable costs. Because guess what? It ain't going to math out exactly right to, what did we say, you travel 3,000 miles, what did we say, nine cents a gallon, nine cents a mile? If you, nine cents a mile is that number that we came up with earlier, 3,000 miles, that's 270 dollars for gas, oil, and tires. And guess what? It, it's probably not exactly perfectly 270 miles, I mean 270 dollars that be for a business. Do you buy a dozen cakes? It takes two cakes to make a two, it takes two eggs to make a cake. So if you had 200 eggs, how many cakes should that be? 100 cakes. Is it going to get you 100 cakes? No, why not? Because some of them might get broken. Some of them might get stolen. You know, a couple of employees are going to be sticking eggs in their pocket before they walk out the door. Yes. You know, stuff happens. A cake might be, okay, it might end up in a batter and a cake, but the cake gets burned because somebody's goofing off instead of watching the oven, and then it gets thrown out. So you might not do the full, you got it, you bought enough eggs to do 100 cakes, but you may only get 97 cakes out of it, right? But you did 100 cakes worth of egg buying, right? So you look at what is the total amount of money that you spent and you divide it up. You lost me. Hmm? You lost me. I lost you? No, you lost. Oh, yes, That's lost money. Lost money. So yes. Yes. For the, for the yeah. And so that ideally, you figure out that loss. I know that if I order 100 eggs, it's only enough to make 97 cakes. So I need to make sure that the 97 cakes I make are going to make me enough money. You pay for those three, those six eggs that ended up on the floor or ended up in somebody's pockets. So, yeah, that's just stealing, theft, destruction. That is a variable cost that you need to factor in. Those of you in the 143 class, we were talking about that. You have people not paying you debts back. That's something else you got to factor in. If you're selling on credit, you got to assume that not all 100% of the people that you sold on credit are going to pay you back. So how much of it are you, how, how much does it normally end up in? So, you can do the, how many miles, 3,000 times price of inputs, 9 cents, and get this $270 that I was talking about. Um, but the, to do it that way isn't real, like I said, it's not the most accurate, because doing it this way, it's going to get your number close, 270 is going to be close, but it's not going to count for the eggs to get stolen, the eggs to get broken, it doesn't account for the fact that, okay, yeah, normally, Sam gets 35 miles a gallon in that Honda, but he ain't getting 35 miles a gallon when he's driving that thing down that back road trying to hide the cops because he was speeding, right? And he wasn't getting 35 miles a gallon when he was doing 85 miles an hour on the highway either, right? So sometimes he ain't getting 35 miles a gallon. Warming your car up in the winter, running that air conditioner in the summer. Yeah. It ain't perfect. The, the, the time that he goes out there, he's like crazy, start doing donuts in the parking lot. Well, he's using up more than one penny's worth of rubber there, right? So just to blindly, well, it should be nine cents a mile and multiply it out. Doing it that way. It's going to get you number in the ballpark, but it ain't accurate. It ain't complete. So ideally, you take the, you pull out all your receipts, you see, uh, should be 270, but when I go digging through my wallet and I found all the receipts, it ends up being 280. So it ends up being really 9.1 cents a mile I drove instead of 9 cents a mile. But that's how you should arrive at that number. Your average variable cost would be to take those receipts and divide it out, which is what I just talked about. Take the, uh, what did I say, 280? Divided by 3,000, and you end up with 9.1 cents. I cheated and I, at the beginning, and I went backwards. I asked him what was his fuel mileage, what was his, how, how often did he get oil changed, and so on. We added up to get this number, but ideally you start with a big number, looking at your receipts and come down to this number, but instead of taking this little number and inflating it up to that 270 that I had, with me on what that oh, is. Okay. 
Go with me there. But for simplicity's sake, on a test and on the homework, probably most of the time, I'm going to give you the nine cent number and have you run with it from there. Well, I could give you the 270 or 280 number and have you divide out either way. But just on a test and on a homework, it's going to be the same number either way you go at it. But the math is easy. You take one number and you divide by the other one. You, if you had the total, you divide to get the variable. If you had the variable, you multiply to get the total. It's just that easy. You mark them. Total variable cost $280. Output three thousand, so that's right. You OCD people want for our book company. They have two hundred thousand dollars worth of paper and ink that they're using in ebooks. They had what a hundred thousand worth of machines, printing presses, and stuff. They've got two hundred thousand dollars worth of paper and ink that they use to print forty thousand books. So that costs. Five dollars worth of ink and paper for each book that they print. That's what had the variable cost. This is their variable cost. That's not counting the fixed cost. Not counting fixed cost that we saw earlier, but I gave them two dollars and fifty cents a week for that number. So, two thousand dollars worth of ink, paper, labor, electricity to print forty thousand books. It costs them five dollars worth of paper and ink and electricity per book. The marginal cost, that is the question that I think that you, you're not going to calculate this one. I mean, you can, but we won't. But that is the question that I asked him when we came over that nine cent number. If you would drive one more mile, what would it cost you to drive one more mile? It should cost nine cents. At the speed you're doing, and that number, it, it would vary. If he's doing 30 miles an hour, it might cost him nine and a half cents a mile. If he's doing 80 miles an hour, it might cost him 10 cents a mile to drive. If he's doing 55 miles an hour, it might cost him exactly nine. But if he's still doing 50 miles an hour and he keeps driving 50 miles an hour, what's it going to cost him to drive that next mile? So that's really going to be that nine cent number. Are you all with me? Wait, I'm going to finish the math and I can come back because I just realized I've really been ignoring the graphs that I've been drawing here. So we have total costs. Total costs is your fixed cost and variable costs because there's nothing left. It either changes or it doesn't, right? So there's nothing left to be added in there. So you have our total cost. What is the total amount that he spent on his car payment, on his insurance payment, on his tags, plus his gas, his oil, his tires, what is the total amount of money that Sam spent on this car? That is total cost. What was that? $606 worth of car payments, insurance, and tags, plus $270 worth of gas and oil and tires. So how much did he spend to be riding around in this Honda this month? That is $870. $876. Sam spent $876 for the joy and privilege of driving this car 3,000 miles last month. Was it worth it? Look at the number now. Exactly. This is what you got to do. Look at that number now. It's car buying. Especially because he's if you use it for personal use. To be driving riding around looking cool in a Honda versus looking weird in a 1973 Ford Pinto, is it worth that eight hundred and seventy six dollar? But of course that Ford Pinto, well, it's only gonna get about eight miles a gallon, so your gas bill could be five hundred. Yeah, but well, you're gonna so have about a twenty dollar car payment and your insurance is gonna be pretty low, but then you can have repair bills, so it's going to so you average total cost is take that one number was that 876? You got two ways to do that. Take 876 divided by 3,000. 
or take the what, 20 cents, our average fixed cost, plus 9 cents, our average variable cost. Which is easier? Add two small numbers together or divide two big numbers? Add the two small ones. Either way, you get the same results. 876 divided by 3,000 is going to give you 29 cents. So you do it big way or the little way. Either way, you get the same thing. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that. For having this car doing deliveries, people, boom time, whatever it is he's delivering. If he does 3,000 miles with the deliveries, he just spent, what was it, $270 on gas plus $606 on car payments and insurance. So if he does 3,000 miles worth of deliveries, it costs him 29 cents per mile to help and drive that car 3,000 miles. So Sam, if, when you're going to find a customer who calls you up and says, hey Sam, I need you to make a delivery, how much are you going to charge them? This is your starting point. If you don't know that number, you have no clue what to charge people. If Sam can't do deliveries for more than 30 cents a mile, forget about it. He needs to make more than 30 cents a mile, but more than 29 cents a mile. He needs 29 cents a mile will just get the car to break even. But he wants more than break even. He wants to make a profit, right? He likes the car to pay for itself and then some. But then there's also something else. He needs to put in his time too, right? So he needs to go in. So how much do you need to be charging somebody for doing deliveries? Seventy-five cents, a dollar a mile, That's something like this. To replace something there. Yeah, uh, to build up a little emergency fund for if the thing breaks down, so you have some money to store away to repairs. That's why your Ubers. How much is have any of you ever Ubered? How much did it cost you mile to Uber? It depends um, on where you're at and how big the vehicle is. But when I was in New Orleans, those smaller vehicles were about cost of the time. That was when it was first starting. Okay. 250, you said pack per mile? Yeah, I think the bigger vehicles were 20 bucks. Yeah. Um, the fatalities that I was with were larger groups, so we had at least like they were black and larger vehicles, you know, like six bucks or something along. Okay. I didn't expect them to say that. They much for it. But, think, but okay, now, now we're talking here, 29 cents a mile for a very fuel efficient and relatively inexpensive other car. Compared to the van that uh, Connor's group was being picked up in that had the van, it's nowhere near as fuel efficient, and the van was twice as expensive, and being a passenger van commercial, higher insurance rates, so it may very well have cost about 40 cents a mile worth of fixed cost for that van, plus probably 25 cents a mile worth of variable cost. So they're starting out, they need to get 65 cents just in order to pay for the van. And, they have to pay and then they got to pay for the driver and then you kick back for the tuber for the developing the app and doing the system in first place. That's why Uber is what you call. So doing deliveries. Sam is doing his deliveries. It only costs him 29 cents a mile to do it. Who can I pick on this? Okay, Connor, congratulations. This is your van. He is more expensive vehicle, less fuel efficient. It costs him 65 cents a mile. Does that give Sam an advantage? Yeah, there's competition. Sam can do what? Lower his price. Sam could be absolutely evil and lower his price to 64 cents. He's still making profit above his 29 cents. He's making, what's that, 35 cents profit? But that's one penny cheaper than Connor can do anything. So what happens to Connor? He's kind of out of business, right? So Sam can 
cut his price to 64 cents. Cotter goes out of business, and it's saying was the only competitor in town, and then he can turn around and raise his price. Boom, there you go. But then if he turns around and raises his price, his founder might be sitting there saying, hey, I've got another van, let me try again. So you can't, you don't get too carried away in raising your prices, but the cheaper and more efficient you are, the more options and flexibility you have. If times get hard, if competition gets going, you've got more flexibility there because you're the more efficient producer. So. You with me on the mess? I'll come back to the graph. For the book printing people, it cost them a hundred. They had a hundred thousand dollars worth of machine billing truck payments each month, two hundred thousand dollars worth of paper and ink and labor. All total cost them three hundred thousand dollars a month is what they're spending. That works out to for the forty thousand books. That number did not show up yet. Sorry. Uh, their average fixed cost is two dollars fifty cents. Now hundred thousand divided by the forty thousand books. Their average variable cost was five hundred, I mean five dollars to two hundred thousand divided by forty books. So all total, their average total cost seven dollars fifty cents. If they can't sell these books for more than seven dollars fifty cents, they shouldn't start. But if they can sell it for more than seven dollars fifty cents, anything that they make beyond seven fifty is profit, and you're getting the woohoo territory there, right? Because when you're factoring it in. You need to make sure you've got all the variable costs. When, when Sam is making his list of variable costs, he's got six dollars worth, I mean six six cents worth of gas, two cents worth of oil, a penny's worth of spark plugs, and he also needs to put in fifty cents a mile for his labor. That needs to be baked in from the get go. Are you with me? This man, it ain't that hard, but it's downright fundamental to understanding where your price needs to start. Where does my price need to be in order to make this thing work? To know whether I should bother or not. Should I buy the car and use it to do Ubering? Because Sam's going to ask the question. So all of his math that we just looked at is predicated on his, I think I can do 3,000 miles worth of deliveries. What if he's wrong and he can only do 50? He's in trouble. What if he's right? What if he's wrong and he can actually do more than that? He's going to make extra profit beyond that, right? But he's got to do his guess before. I, if I start this business, how how much do I think I'm going to be able to do? How much am I going to need to charge? You need to know this stuff. This is where you market research and that kind of stuff comes into play. So the average cost includes the labor as well. Yes. You bake that into your variable costs. You bake everything. I oversimplified. I only talked about the car. I didn't talk about the human. But in reality, you bake the human in there. So your variable cost is not 90 cents. Your variable cost is going to be like 59 cents because you're going to charge them 50 cents a mile for your time. You bake it all in. Your cell phone bill, you would include that. If you're using this car as an Uber business, so it's not only car expenses, you have your cell phone bill in there. So that's going to jump up your. Fixed cost by another 50 bucks a month. Um, you include the whatever kickbacks you've got to give Uber. You include that in your variable costs. Your time will be included in the variable cost. Your food, because the food that you're eating while you're driving around is more expensive than the food you'd be eating if you were sitting at home. That difference you would make in. So you put it all in there to determine how much extra it can cost me be driving around with this car doing this instead of sitting home on my couch. You got to put it all in there. And then that will give you the number that you need to work with. Are we with? Okay. Yeah, let me go back over it. It's a thing that I didn't do. I talked about fixed costs. For you visual learners, it's a flat line. $606. Right? Don't matter how many miles you drive. Variable cost, I mean, the average fixed cost, it's going to go down, and it's going to go down dramatically to begin with. Because what if he had this car, and he only used this car to drive one mile? 606 divided by 1 equals 
But what if he used his car to drive two miles? That cut it in half right off of the bat. Right. So you're going to get a dramatic decrease right off the bat. 606 divided by 100, that gets it down to 6. But then, yeah, but then, you know, so you're going to have a sharp decrease, but then eventually it's going to sort of, it's not going to completely flatten out, but the gains aren't going to be that much. Yeah. To take that 606 and divide it by 80,000 versus taking 606 divided by 100,000, not that big of a difference there. So visually, this is what it's going to look like. The more you use, the lower that fixed cost is going to go. So for somebody looking to buy equipment, that's part of the thing. You need to be looking at how much can I use, and the more I can use it, the lower my fixed costs are going to be. Because that car ain't doing him any good, it ain't making him any money when it's sitting in the garage. The tractor's not making you any money when it's sitting in the machine chair. The more acres you have, the more you're using the tractor, the more you can justify the expense of paying for that tractor because you've got more acres that's going to make you money to help you pay off that tractor. Right? That's the way it works. And then the more and more and more acres, the more you use that tractor, the more it's being used, the less it's sitting. And it's going to make you that much more money. So if you have something go wrong with one of your acres of your crop, it ain't going to kill you because you've got plenty of others to make the money you need to pay your tractor off. So visually, you want to knock this thing out. Oh, my. Your variable cost. They actually, they're going to stair step their way up. Your variable cost in the long term, they're going to keep doing this over and over and over again. It ain't flat. So here's here, here, here what happens. You want to bake a cake. How many eggs do you need? Two. two. Can you go to the grocery store and say, I'd like two eggs? They do sell them in one I saw they sell them in fours. Okay. They sell them in fours, but they don't sell them in twos. How, how much sugar do you need to bake a cake? I don't know, a pound. Can you get a pound bag of sugar? I don't know. I don't know. How, how much flour do you need? A pound. Can you get a flour, pound bag of flour? No, it comes five pound bags. So what ends up happening? In order for you to bake the first cake, you got to buy a whole dozen eggs, a whole dozen, a, a whole five-pound bag of sugar, a whole five-pound bag of flour, a whole jar of vanilla extract. But then what happens for cake number two? You just need some leftover eggs, some leftover flour, some leftover sugar you have. But so the, the, the costs are going to, but then what happens when you get to cake number four? You got to buy some more. You got to buy, when you get to cake number, no, okay, when you get to cake number five, you've used up all of your flour and your sugar. You got to buy more flour and sugar to do cake number six. But you, after cake number six, what happens? That's when you got to go out and buy your second, second dozen eggs, right? It's the same thing for the hot dogs and the buns. There's eight hot dogs in the pack, and there's 10 buns in the pack. Or no, the other way around. There's 10 hot dogs in the pack. Eight months in the pack. Seriously, it's a conspiracy, right? So you just it's constantly going to be changing, but over time, it will eventually smooth out because it's going to spread out at one point because you're you're going to be getting to you know where you can buy some eggs or buy some sugar or buy some flour or buy some vanilla extract and that kind of stuff. But your costs are going to spike initially because it's starting from zero, and then it's going to flatten out. But then you start getting. To where your costs are going to start ratcheting up. Because you get to the point of, okay, we were making, we went from making one cake an hour to then we're making two cakes an hour going in the same oven. But then we're making eight cakes an hour, we're working two shifts, we're paying people overtime, we're hiring extra people, we're in each other's way because we've got so many bakers baking cakes and in each other's way in the kitchen and we're running into each other and this kind of stuff. So we're going to start getting inefficient again. So our variable costs are going to start increasing.
because you start hiring more workers, paying more overtime, and that kind of stuff. So it's going to stair step. So inefficient is going to plants somewhat not all the way. Try that again. If you're efficient, you say it's not if you're not efficient, it will go well. Well, so you lose efficiency because you have no choice but to lose efficiency until you adjust by buying a second oven, getting a second building, or something like that. Until you adjust, if you don't adjust the number of buildings, tractors, equipment, houses, ovens, refrigerators, if you don't adjust that, you're going to start getting inefficient. If you only have the one mixer and it's running wide open and you're still trying to make even more cakes, well, instead of somebody using a blender, you got somebody over there with a bowl and stuff. And it's going to take them longer to whisk it with a bowl and spoon than it is to do the thing. So you inherently are going to be getting less efficient per cake until you go out and buy another mixer. Your marginal cost, excuse me, your average variable cost is really capturing that whole five eggs, six sugar, five eggs, six dozen. It does eggs, five pounds of sugar, five pounds of flour kind of thing because your average it's going to go down because you had to buy all of the eggs and sugar and stuff first time. Well, the marginal one's going to capture it even more, but it's going to your average cost is going to drop down because you can start getting more efficient. Because instead of that oven being used to bake one cake a day, that oven is going to get run to where you're baking two cakes at a time all day long as soon as one cake comes out and another one goes in and that kind of stuff. So you're going to get more efficient use of that oven. But for the egg sugar, the blender, the electricity, the flour, and that kind of stuff, and then it's going to start, your workers are going to start getting in the way of each other and it's going to go up. Marginal one is the one I'm This is the one that really, that this is right about laying The cake number one, you had to buy a whole dozen eggs, a whole five pound bag of sugar, a whole five pound bag of flour. Cake number two costs you only, you already got the eggs, you already got the sugar, you already got the flour. So what are you spending there? Electricity and labor. That's pretty much it. So that's all that's getting spent on cake number two. But then your costs are going to start going up as you start getting to the point where it's time to buy another bag of flour. And then a little bit later, time to buy another bag of sugar. A little later, time to buy another jar of vanilla extract. A little bit later, time to buy some more chocolate chips, and so on. So it's going to dip down, but then it's going to start marching way up steadily. So it's not going to dip down as much as you go down. Yeah. This is the one that I want to do. Total variable cost, as we talked about, is going to start. Start at zero. If you ain't baking any cakes, no eggs, no sugar, no flour, right? But then you're going to be buying ingredients and you're going to be using other produce. And then you can start getting more inefficient. But that's all your variable costs. And then when you add in your fixed costs, that's going to give you this total cost. These two lines can exactly parallel one another. The distance between them is this distance here because you're adding them together. Don't worry about that because I don't think I asked about that. But just for you visual learners, just know that. So these are the test lines. You have to look at that. No, you're just going to be doing the math. Now, just for you visual learners, I just wanted you to see the relationships, to see sort of what's going to happen. Now, here's the fun one that I want to get back to the, that we hinted at a minute ago. In the long run, everything is variable. In the long term, everything is variable. Your short term, your very your costs are gonna look like this for your ovens, your sugar, I mean your sugary your flour, your eggs. This is what you sit and you labor, this is what your situation can look like. In the long run, if your production keeps increasing, you're making more and more cakes, you can buy a second oven. You make even more and more and more cakes, you can buy a third of them. You keep making more and more and more cakes, you can buy a fourth of them. You keep making more and more cakes, you can hire another worker. You keep making more, you can hire another worker. You keep making even more, you can hire yet another worker. You're gonna you keep making more, you're gonna get a second building, you're gonna get a second delivery truck, a third delivery truck, a fourth delivery truck. So in reality, this curve is just showing 
where you are now, given the tractors you have now, the ovens you have now, the refrigerators you have now, the building you have now, the trucks you have now, the blenders you have now. But in reality, you can smooth things out by buying another oven, buying another truck, whatever. But then you're going to start getting any fish again, then it's time to do what? Buy yet another oven, buy yet another truck, and then it just keeps climbing its way up. In the long term, everything ends up being a variable cost. But we don't think, generally for business decision-wise, we're not looking long term, we're looking short term. What is my rent now? What is my car payment now? What do I have to pay now? That's the question Sam asked himself now to know how many hours he needs to work at this month because he knows what his bills are now. He knows, yeah, in a couple of years he's going to be getting rid of that Honda and he's going to get himself a Mercedes, but he knows he's going to have to work more hours then. But he'll cross that bridge when he gets to it because he's going to be doing that because he's going to be getting a higher paycheck because he's graduating from here and getting a better paying job than what he's getting working the, the learning college down the hallway. Y'all got to the CLC now called the Learning Commons. I've had a hard time adjusting to the name switch. They sort of sprung it on us and didn't really spark it. But anyway. So, does all of that make sense to you? Yes, no, maybe. Go with me. Like, I don't know. Let me see if I'll work two ads. Uh, the homework is going to be available, like say, a few minutes after class. If somebody reminds me he has a class, go make it available, and I'll give you up until like next Thursday before the test. You get it done because it won't do you any good after the test. Okay, now I'm going to play the brand shirt. When do you shut down and say, oh crap, I'm not going to do this anymore? The answer is not what you think. We did the math and we said Sam's average fixed cost was 20 cents a mile. His average variable cost was 9 cents a mile. So his average total cost was 29 cents. So, what do y'all think? If he can't make 29 cents a mile, he shouldn't do this, right? It isn't the right answer. What did Sam just, I think he said, whether he drives the car or not, that doesn't go away, does it? You use this number in a decision, am I going to buy the car and start the business? But if you've already started the business, you've got the car, he's got the car, he's got to make the car payments. He's got to make his insurance payments. So as long as he can make more than nine cents a mile, if he can make 10 cents a mile, that's going to be nine cents a mile, we'll pay for all of his gas, all of his oil, all of his tires, and it'll give him one penny to put toward paying off that $606 in the O's. Maybe they know, but that is your cutoff point. If, you can, if he cannot make nine cents a mile on this car, he needs to shut down. If it's gonna cost him nine cents to drive it, then you're only gonna pay him eight cents. Every mile he's driving is causing him to lose more money. His debt's gonna get bigger. So if that's the case, you pull off to the side of the road right where you are and you abandon the thing and walk away. Because the more you're driving, the more money that's leaving your pocket. If nine cents is leaving your pocket for each mile and only eight is coming back, you're losing a stinking penny with every extra mile you drive. Yeah, but say for instance, okay, ideally, we want to make more than 29 cents because then we can make profit. But if he's only making 20 cents, well, that ain't enough to pay all of his fixed costs. But it'll cover all those variable costs and some of those fixed costs. Maybe it'll cover half of it. So instead of 
Sam, haven't you figured out, well, okay, I got to dig around in grandma's pocketbook and steal $600 from her pocketbook to pay my bills. Instead, no, he's only got to steal 300 from her because he got 300 of it off of doing some of these deliveries, right? Don't steal from your grandma. Seriously, steal from somebody else's grandma. You know who you are. Does that make sense to you? I think I've got another slide that explains this. Or maybe this one does a little more detail. But as long as the price that he can sell is higher than the average variable cost, he should keep producing. Because it's not paying all of his fixed costs, but it's paying some of it. Yeah. He's driving that car and nine cents, they're giving him 20 cents a mile. Nine cents of that mile is going to pay for the gas. And he's got 11 cents a mile going into the bucket that he needs to get build up to $606 to pay off all of his expenses. The more money that he gets in that bucket from doing deliveries, the less money he has to get from somewhere else. Stealing, stealing drugs, whatever he's got to do. Working in a tutoring center. The learning commons, excuse me. Even though he isn't making a profit, he needs to keep at it. Guess what, y'all? This happens all freaking time. If you don't believe me, look at all the businesses that did not shut down in 2008, in 2009, and 2010. Yeah, we hit a little speed bump. We know it's a little bit ugly now, but we're going to hold on thinking that you know, we'll lose a little bit of money now, but at least if we pay some of our bills or not all of our bills, when things improve, we'll still be in business to make money in the future. The word farmers come to mind. How many soybean farmers took a beating financially last year because of the trade war and that kind of stuff? They took an absolute beating last year, and why did they not screw up middle fingers in the air, put for sale sign out front? Because they still, why did they, well, the price of soybeans is down to $1.35 for it, so screw it. I ain't doing it anymore, middle fingers in there, I'm gonna go inside and watch TV. Well, they still gotta pay their truck tractor payment, they still gotta pay the house payment, they still gotta pay the property tax, and they're not going to sell the farm because they're like, hey, things should be better next year, and I'll make enough money next year to pay for the tractor, pay for the lot, the house payment, and so on. So a lot of businesses, they get to, they got to the point, which I don't know if you remember, or the beginning of the semester, they were, they, of course not. Uh, they, businesses, would, they would lower their price. You know, if demand is going away. Customers are leaving. Well, in 2008, we were leaving because we lost our jobs. But if customers are leaving, what were the businesses going to do? Lower their price to try to keep the cut as many, to try to keep from losing as many customers. Lowering their price, even though they're selling less, they're like, better to make a little bit so we can at least keep the lights on until things improve. This happens all the time. The business is going to temporarily end up losing money, but they keep running because the future looks good. Now, if Sam is like, he's driving a car, he ain't making money, and it looks like he's never going to make money in the future, yeah, you sell the car and keep going. But in the meantime, as long as you got the car payment, you keep driving that car, you put four sales signs on the car, and you keep driving, you keep making deliveries because it's helping until you can get rid of the car. But you don't want to sell the car if you think the future's going to look good and you can make a bunch of money off of it in not too distant future. So that's the thinking there. Even if you're not making a profit, there you go. For you accounting people, here you go. Somebody has a average fixed cost of $5, average variable cost of $10. They can sell their service for only $12. It costs them $15, but they only make $12. If they say, screw it, I'm not doing anything, I'm sitting home watching Judge Judy, it's going to cost them $5 a month to pay the bills. But if they operate, they go ahead and make the cake, they're going to bring in 12 for only spending the extra 10. So when it does settle, they are only losing three. Which would you rather do, lose three or lose five? Dollars, you'd rather lose three. Pounds? Maybe you'd rather lose five, right? But financially, 
That's the situation. If you quit, you got to pay all that fixed cost yourself. If you keep working, you're at least getting your customers to pay two of those five dollars, then you only have to pay the other three out of your pocket. So you need to keep paying the fixed cost. Yeah. If you quit, you still got to pay your car payment. Even if you quit driving, say, I'm sick of driving, I hate driving, I hate traffic. As long as that car is sitting in your driveway, you got to make that car payment. So what you do, like I just said two minutes ago, you keep driving this car until you can sell it. Put a for sale sign on it, but you keep driving it until you can sell it. But you only do that if you think the future looks as bad or worse than the present. Another example over here is if your variable cost, fixed cost is five, your variable cost is six. Well, if you quit, well, you're out five dollars, but if you work, you make one dollar profit. Woo All right. That's just for sake of comparison. I don't really know why I stuck that in there. All right. One dollar profit for some of you that might not get you very, might not get the hard racing as one dollar profit. That's after all of your costs. And you, like I said, you need to factor in everything. Your gas, your oil, your tires, your car payment, your insurance payment, your time, stress. If this job is more stressful than your other job, you need to be building in some kind of reward for that. Some kind of, well, how much more do I need to make to do in a stressful job than a non-stressful job? You add it in there. The fact that this job may take you to this, you have less time to hang out with your family and friends. Well, how much financial reward will you, do you need to get in order to make up for not hanging out with your family and friends? You add it in there. And if you had all of that added in there, and then you're still making profit after that, woohoo! Right? After everything has been covered, and absolutely everything has been covered, and then you make over and above that, that's fantastic. Yeah, it ain't a thousand, it ain't a million, but it's more than you were looking for and saying you needed or wanted. So if you can't, if Sam can't make the full 29 cents, well, at least he needs to be making enough money to pay for the ingredients, to pay for the gas, the oil, and the tires, or else every extra mile is going to cost him even more money. As long as he's doing that, you pay for all of those variable costs and at least some of the fixed costs. But only as long as the car is functional. If the car ain't functioning anymore, if you're losing money doing this, are you really going to want to spend a couple thousand dollars to place transmission on a car that ain't moving much good anyway? Yeah. If you use it, it's helping you pay for itself, even if it ain't fully paying for itself. If you don't use it, you still have to pay for it and it ain't helping. It's like having kids. They ain't helping you pay for themselves. They cost you no matter what, whether they're working on giving you money or not. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Metaphorically, I, 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 I did this imagination there. I have I had two buckets. Sam, two buckets. Number one is the variable cost bucket. Number two is fixed cost bucket. Variable cost bucket, he knows it's nine cents for the gas and oil and tires. So for every delivery that he makes, he needs to be coming home that evening, dipping nine cents for every mile he drove into this variable cost bucket. So that at the end of the month, when his gas bill comes in, he's got the money to pay for it. When it's time to pay for the tires, he's got the money to pay for it. But then over here in this bucket, this is fixed cost bucket, and he's got the number 606 written on it. Because he needs to get 606 into this bucket to pay for his car payment, the insurance, the license plates, the county sticker, the inspection, those things. Once this bucket gets beyond 606, he doesn't need to put any more money in that bucket. So then what happens to every penny that he makes more than nine cents a mile after that? That goes into bucket number three called party fund, right? Profits. Woohoo. So, contribution margin. This is a concept, and this is part of this that I actually like. The, the idea of how much money, we were saying this is doing these deliveries, how much money 
from those deliveries is he getting that he can contribute toward going into the six hundred six dollar bucket and or going into the profit bucket. So ultimately, this is easy calculations. How much money is he making? Subtract out the nine cents a mile with the gas and oil. And then that's going to tell him how much money he's making per mile that he can use to pay his fixed costs and or go apart. That's right here. That's bucket number one. So um, let's see. Um, your variable cost is nine cents a mile, right? Let's say he's doing deliveries, he's only charging 50 cents a mile. So what's happening here? 50 cents minus 90 cents, 41 cents. He gets 50 cents to do one mile with the delivery, nine cents of it goes into the pay, paying for gas bucket, and that's 41 cents that's contributing toward his savings of $606. That he needs to pay off his fixed cost. Go with me. Not rocket science here. I hope. So, once you got six hundred six dollars in this bucket, you don't need to put any more in this bucket. So then, for every fifty, every mile he does, nine cents goes in this bucket. Forty-one cents goes into bucket number three, the profit bucket, the throw a party bucket. The woohoo, I'm gonna, I don't know, set it on fire, just sniff a few buckets. The I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna buy some eight balls of crack and I'm gonna put them on a pool ball, pool table, and really freak some people out. Buckets. All right. Y'all know what y'all are gonna do with extra money. What would y'all do with extra money? Y'all won the lottery. What stupid thing would y'all do with this? Wear, wear a screen mask. Do what? Wear a screen mask. Oh, you would wear a screen mask. Okay. Yeah. Have you seen that article? <laughs> the guy uh, wore a screen costume to uh, uh, hide his identity from brothers. So, uh, but that's what cool. I don't know. Do you, you need money? Like, I don't know. There, there, there's a few stupid things. I've already told y'all one of my dreams is to get to, right out of the Krispy Kreme place, slide the thing off of the end of the conveyor belt, and I'm just going to tip my head down and leave my head back. This is what these donuts just drop off the conveyor belt right into my mouth. That's one of my dreams. Another one would be, I don't know, take a TV, get the big, biggest big screen TV that I can, and I don't know, put like the New England Patriots on there, and then just let me take a break. Oh, <laughs> just oh, something, you know, just, you know, that is it's a little bit of 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 a little they got some stuff about him cheating on his wife, and they got some naked pictures of him kind of thing, and they sent him, like, some kind of letter, which is more or less blackmailing him kind of thing. But Bezos, he already owns, like, a Washington Post newspaper, so somebody was like, well, why doesn't he just buy the Inquirer and shut him down? It would be so, and, and he could do that without even blinking. Right. For him buying the National Enquirer is about the same decision as you buying a pack of Gum financially. It would just be so fantastic that anybody got a problem with me. That would be nice. Done. Yes, it would. <laughs> Done. <laughs> but you dropped it. You dropped yes, it. I did. Well, that, that's the metaphorical mic drop. Yeah. Accident, accidentally and uncoolly, but yeah. So, um, okay. So Sam was making 41 cents per mile. Okay. But this one is a fun way to look at what, well, okay, maybe it is fun to look at it. But y'all understand what this number is representing here? Yeah. Now, there is a slightly better way to look at this. Okay, I just did this. 50 cent, 9 cent, 41 cent, for those of you following along in my Okay, another example. If they sell in those books for nine dollars and their variable cost was five dollars, then they get four dollars per book to help pay for their equipment. So the better way to look at the contribution margin is to talk about it as a percent. Because then you can compare yourself with other people to see how efficient you are compared to how efficient they are. Because Sam is getting 41 cents a mile, well, okay, compared to his lowly nine cents a mile worth of gas, that's doing okay. Where somebody else, a 
less efficient vehicle, higher variable cost, selling, whole different thing, but it's hard to compare. And what you do is you take that contribution margin in terms of dollars, what was that, 41 cents? And you divide it by the price to get a percent. So what's that tell you? 82% of the money that Sam makes is available to help him pay his very his fixed cost. 82% is available for fixed cost. Only 18% of the money is needed to pay for his gas, his oil, his tires. 82% is going toward paying off that 606, but then what happens? After he's paid off that 606, every extra mile he drives, 82% of that extra money is going into the party fund. Does that inspire you? If you know that most of the money that I'm making by doing extra work is all woohoo, party down kind of money, yeah, we get excited about that. We don't get excited about, well, 82% of my money is going to pay my electric bill. And, right. And, uh, it's nice to look at this in terms of percentage. Um, some businesses are going to have higher variable costs, so they don't have as much of a contribution margin, which means they have to produce more and more and more in order to pay off their vehicle, pay off their oven, pay off their truck, whatever it is. In this case, Sam, 82% of the money he's making is going to help him pay off his car. Where Connor, what did we say? He, his, it's like his average variable cost is like 20 cents instead of nine. So, so he's only, only 60% of his money is available to help him pay off his van. So what is that telling him? He's got to drive more miles before he pays off and starts making profit than Sam does. Because he isn't as efficient because this vehicle is not as efficient. Go with me? I know that was an interesting amount of numbers there, but the math isn't very complicated. Spend a few minutes, look at the homework, come in here Tuesday, we'll talk about it within reason, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so do the homework and do the homework, get the right answers, put it back in there so you can do 100 on the homework, hand, hand, point, point. But do the homework before we talk about it Tuesday. We'll talk about it Tuesday so you can make sure you're on board with doing math. But it's you know, math is very complicated. It doesn't matter if you want to get on top of that. The test is Thursday. We'll talk about the homework Tuesday. Yeah. And you don't have an interesting weekend.